The other thing that's very, very powerful for kids and for adults, but especially for kids because their brain is still plastic, as we say, can change very easily in response to experience, is to view things at a distance. When you go outside in the morning and get that sunlight or what throughout the day, periodically you want to try and view things that are beyond, certainly beyond the extent of your phone or your computer or the walls of a house, but also off into the distance. If you can view a horizon even better, but if you can't try and look across the street, down the street as far as you can, there's a number of reasons for doing this. First of all, viewing things up close all day um, is a very active process of um, keeping that lens in your eye, a particular shape and the muscles of your eye, and it can lead to headaches, it can lead to eye strain. Many people who have migraines have migraines because they're just not looking far enough into the distance very much. The other thing is that getting that sunlight outside during the day through mechanisms separate from the clock mechanisms is known to improve mood and improve metabolic function. And this is because of the linkage between the eye and a structure has a weird name called the habenula. Um, the habenula is a little um, structure in the thalamus, um, kind of middle of the thalamus, for those of you that want to know, that is associated with the dopamine system and with feeding and regulation of mood and feeding rhythms. This is the beautiful work of Samar Hatar, who's the head of the chronobiology unit at the National Institutes of Mental Health and others. So there's real science to back up what I'm saying here. And the, so get outside during the day as much as possible. Take a walk, view things in the distance. Don't be looking at your phone like this as you walk. Um, getting your the optics of your eyes into what we call panoramic vision, where you're, you're not necessarily moving your head or eyes around a lot, but you're just kind of opening up that, that aperture of your visual field. Very important, and especially in kids. So we're talking now about improving sleep, improving wakefulness, improving concentration through morning light viewing, improving sleep, uh, improving, uh, or I should say offsetting the development of myopia, nearsightedness, possibly even reversing myopia or some of that myopia in, uh, in adults. We're talking about um, also anxiety relief. One of the things that's really exciting in the last few years um, is that and we've known this for a long time, but that when we move through what we call, um, the scientists are so geeky, when we, so when we, when we self-generate motion, whether or not on a bicycle or running or jogging or just even walking, doesn't matter what speed, the visual world is slipping by us, right? But we don't actually see blurry blur going by like we would if we took a picture on our phone and moved our phone. And that's because we have what are called slip compensating eye movements where we're constantly making adjustments for the, uh, the slip of the visual image on, on our retina. And those slip compensating eye movements and forward movement in particular, as long as it's self-generated, is known to directly inhibit and powerfully inhibit the activity of the, of the threat reflex that involves brain areas like the amygdala, which is associated with fear and anxiety. In other words, walking forward or biking forward or jogging forward, provided that your visual system isn't staring at your phone the whole time, and no, unfortunately, this won't work on a treadmill, um, when you do that, you're actually creating an anxiety relief. And this is, you know, get it. So we're talking about very basic things. Get outside and take a walk. Don't look at your phone while you're doing it. Run outside as opposed to on a treadmill if you can safely do that. Some people might say, well, on the Peloton, I see all this stuff streaming by, but ah, it's not actually streaming by. It's a slightly different situation. Probably better than not having any visual imagery there, but get outside, take a walk, view things at a distance. Even if you're just doing this 10, 15 minutes a day, you're doing tremendous things for your health. And kids who aren't doing this, who are locked to screens all day and all night, I'm, I mean, I don't wanna be hyperbolic, but they're messing themselves up and their brain is very plastic. They're, they're going to have issues, uh, vision issues, anxiety issues. Um, it, it's, it's really serious. And um, sadly, there isn't enough attention on this at the kind of national and international level. But there is a lot of science to support the practices that, that we're talking about here. Yeah. And again, all these practices that you've mentioned so far are completely free of charge, right? There's, there's nothing. And, and, you know, like me, I know you're, you're super passionate about that. So it's, I think it's one of, the, one of the many reasons why I'm drawn to your work is I always see that with you, this kind of desire to make sure that the things that you recommend where possible are accessible to everyone. And I feel if teachers, if head teachers around the globe could hear that and really think about how they can implement those things within their schools 
again, it's a top-down effect that would have just multiple downstream consequences straight away. Um, what you say about panoramic vision, I think, is fascinating. And I want to talk, if, if it's okay, Andrew, about this sort of bi-directional communication we have between certain behaviors that we have in our brain. So, you know, we could talk about vision or breathing, and hopefully we'll get to that. But, you know, let's take with breath work, for example, if we're feeling super stressed, and we're trying to get through deadlines, you know, that can change the way that we breathe. But at the same time, we can consciously change the way that we breathe to have a calming effect on our brain. And I sort of feel with respect to vision, that's, I think with breath work, we're sort of getting there. Like people are starting to understand that, but I don't think with vision they are. So maybe you could talk to how, whether you have this peripheral sort of soft vision or this kind of tightly focused vision, what is that doing? What messages is that sending up to our brain? Yeah. And I'd be happy to talk about respiration. That's one of the things that my lab works on, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the breathing system is, is amazing because it bridges subconscious and conscious processing, right? All the time yeah. we're breathing and we don't have to think about it, just like our heartbeat, but at any moment we can grab a hold of our breathing and change our breathing. And that's that's a unique um, neural apparatus that allows us to bridge between those two. Um, this The visual system is, is similar in that we are seeing things all the time, but we can also take control of our vision. I can decide to focus in a very you know narrow soda straw view of the world, or I can open up the aperture of my visual field. So let's talk about opening the aperture, so-called panoramic vision. Um, you don't have to, to try this, you can do this anywhere. You don't have to actually be, um, you know, stone still. You just, what you want to do is just um, try and see without moving your head or eyes. What you're trying to do is dilate your gaze so that you're seeing more of the space around you, the ceiling, um, the, the area in front of you. Ideally, you'll see your own body a little bit in your peripheral vision. And when you do this, when you shift into this mode of vision we call panoramic vision, a couple of things happen. One is that you release a, a connection between the brain and the brain stem that's involved in alertness. And so it's not that you become less alert, but it has a, a relaxing effect. It's like coming off of the accelerator just a little bit. If ever you are in an argument or you feel like you're getting triggered um, and you are, you can feel your heart rate increasing, you can feel the you know, when adrenaline hits our system, it hits it very fast and there's this propensity to move and there's a propensity to say things. Um, and if you want to inhibit those reflexes, because those can be kind of life damaging, depending on what you're going to do and what you're going to say. It's also, it's always better to be the calm one in an argument if you can. Um, panoramic vision is great because it's completely covert. Whereas a, I'll, we'll talk about breathing tools in a moment to, to calm down, but breathing tools require a kind of overt shift in one's behavior. So you, you can tell when someone's, you know, or something like that. But with vision, you can, in a very covert way, you can expand your visual field and it will relax you. People have fear of public speaking, people who have challenges um, in different environments, going to the doctor's office, um, face-to-face -face communication for a lot of people is hard, especially if they don't spend much time doing it. And nowadays people, many people are more isolated than before. Um, you. Panoramic vision is a wonderful way to relax the systems of your brain and body just a bit. And what's really fun is that you can start feeling that shift. And the more you do it, the more you engage the, um, the mechanisms by which you decelerate, I would say. This is less of a break than a deceleration. It's not like slamming on the brake of stress. It's coming off the accelerator a little bit. So it allows you to kind of drive the car that is you. Um, and panoramic vision also has a unique feature, which is that you're, you actually become more alert, aware, and responsive. The neurons that, that are responsible for panoramic vision, for the aficionados, so-called magnocellular, meaning large magno neurons of the eye and brain, and big neurons transmit information much faster. So when you uh, catch a ball or when you reflexively do something, you're actually using this panoramic system. Uh, rather than the high acuity fine system and your reaction times go up about fourfold. So, um, you know, you might think, oh, well, I'm kind of tuning out, but you're not tuning out. You're actually far more situationally aware. And um, I'm fortunate to do a little bit of work with people in U.S. and Canadian special operations. You know, we, they talk a lot about situational awareness, going into environments where you can monitor large swaths of, of behavior and activity, but be, be very responsive to things in different locations. 
And so actually panoramic vision is a wonderful way, not just uh, for them to do their work, but when you're walking down the hall, for instance, let's just take an example. You just took a meeting or you get off a of Zoom, you're headed upstairs. Are you gonna look into the narrow box that is your phone and check something bringing you a soda straw view of the world? That's driving those attentional mechanisms up uh, and stress level up. Or are you just gonna walk to your car or down the hall or up the stairs in kind of panoramic vision? Allows your system to relax a little bit so that when you get to your destination, you're able to focus again. Remember, throughout your day, your focus is designed to be a bit of a roller coaster. You weren't designed to wake up in the morning and go, phone, check Instagram, boom, check email get kids to school. Okay, brief trough. What am I going to do? Okay, you know, you think about the way that our attentional system is working and it's it's absurd what, we, what we're demanding of ourselves now. We've killed all the micro breaks throughout the day. And maybe later if we have time, we can talk about neuro learning and the power of micro breaks, um, even 10 second breaks. But I'll just put out a little teaser that even little 10 second pauses in high attentional activities, so learning or a pod, like what we're doing now, talking back and forth, even just little 10 second pauses allow the brain to store a bunch of information much faster about what was just learned. It allows the system to decompress a bit. And here's the real, um, the really powerful aspect of it is that then when you lean back into activity, you have a heightened level of focus. Many, many people out there are struggling. They think, I, my memory is bad. I'm trouble with focus. A lot of people are taking ADHD meds who don't need them. A lot of people need them and are taking them. Let's you know, let's be honest. Uh, there's a lot of ADHD out there, but a lot of people have trouble focusing because they're basically spending their focus, if you will, throughout the day. It's like dropping you know small coins all day long. By the end of the day, you've spent out quite a lot of money. So you have to be judicious in your use of this thing that we call focus and attention. So panoramic vision is one excellent way to do that. Um, ambulating through space, getting that optic flow to shut down the anxiety system. Um, and then, yeah. of course, the sunlight. The, the key point there for me is, for people, is that we, as I said before, many of us sort of know that if we're feeling stressed, we can apply, you know, a selection of breathwork techniques potentially in the moment to change things, change our physiology. But you're sort of really making a very powerful case that we can actually also do that with our peripheral vision, you know, so this could be potentially a regular practice for people in between Zoom calls, get outside. And I guess this is one of the reasons why nature is so calming for us. It, maybe it's not just the fractals in the trees and in the and in the in the coastlines. Maybe it's also the fact that we are by default, presumably going into that peripheral vision. Yeah, you, you know, walking through nature you're, or outdoors of any kind, you're grabbing all of these mechanisms. You're getting sunlight even on a cloudy day. You're getting peripheral or panoramic vision, and you're getting op what we call self-generated optic flow, as I mentioned, which shuts down the the uh, or quiets these threat uh, reflex centers, including the amygdala. So it's uh, you know um, what we see obviously has a powerful effect on how we feel. Um, you know, the brain represents visual images uh, mostly in symbols. Uh, we could play a little mini experiment right now where imagine um, viewing a particular politician's face. It's going to make you feel a certain way and bring about a whole library of ideas uh, associated with that. Um, you know, we, uh, we store things in visual object symbols and those visual object symbols are the gateway into a whole set of ideas about what we're looking at. However, the mechanisms that we're talking about up until now, sunlight viewing, et cetera, evolved long before the mechanisms for high acuity vision, object recognition, face recognition, or color vision. And so we tend to think that, oh, color is so powerful or what we see is so powerful, but far more powerful in terms of our mood and our physiology is when we see, aka light, um, and our mode of physical action as we see. And so this would be self-generated forward optic flow and uh, and so forth. So the point I wanted to make was that, yes, respiration, uh, breathing is very powerful, very powerful, but it requires signals from the body, from the lungs and tissues of the body to the brain, and then the brain will adjust its state. And we can talk about those. Vision, as you recall, is the brain. So it's the fastest route by which we can change our state of mind. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. How we breathe absolutely affects us. 
It even affects the density of our bones. It affects us down to the subatomic level with electrons. So to think that how we breathe does not matter is not based in any real science.